use your expectations, but I'll try my best. What I wanted to say is, I'm going to start by talking about a little bit in a personal sense about why I got involved in responsible tourism. Um, I'm unusual in the sense that although I've been a professor of responsible tourism at two universities, it's really my second career. I got into this by accident. I've never had any formal training in tourism. Um, and most people who work in tourism are marketeers. I cover tourism from a completely different perspective, which is having worked as an educator in communities, uh, primarily in the UK, but also travelling around the world. And that takes me that takes me to my first slide, which is, is this one. It's actually taken when I was tour leading um, with adult education students. And I became, this was very popular at the time, it was the classic eco-tourism statement, kill nothing but time, take nothing but pictures, leave nothing but footprints. And I was really irritated by this, because I was travelling as a privileged tour leader with groups of tourists who were coming to Africa and India in particular, but also I was, I was working in Indonesia as well at the time. And people were coming out enjoying these pristine natural environments and leaving no money behind at all. They were taking photographs, but they were leaving nothing behind for the local communities. If you're a local community and you live in or near one of these forest areas, you were denied access to natural resources which your forebears probably had access to. And it seemed to me that there was a deep iniquity in that, and that actually what tourism needed to do was to make sure that it put things back to the benefit of the local community and also put things back to conservation. And the first piece of academic research that I led on this was a three-year project for the British government looking at whether ecotourism actually exists in the world. And the principle of ecotourism was that it should benefit local communities and it should benefit the conservation of wildlife. And I had the privilege to look at ecotourism at three national parks. One in Zimbabwe in Africa, one in India at Kialania in Barapur um, in Rajasthan, and the other one in Indonesia. The reality was that when we looked at the system level, you could see no contribution from ecotourism to conservation or to local communities. It was very hard to see any difference between ecotourism and the ordinary tourism. That led on, really, to my work on responsible tourism. And I want to talk very briefly about seven different aspects of why responsible tourism matters to me. I want to talk briefly about sustainability. I want then to talk about the opportunities which I think tourism presents, then about responsible tourism, then about travellers and holidaymakers because they are fundamental to making tourism work. I want to look at destinations, I want to look at the business, and I want to end by looking at the importance of evidence and transparency. Because there are lots of people making claims about how wonderful tourism is and how wonderful their businesses are. But I think we need to be challenging people to be providing us with evidence that they really are different from all the others. So first of all, sustainability. Now the problem I have with this was I was at a good university studying politics in 1972, which was when the first World Commission on Environment and Development took place, the Stockholm Conference. I heard nothing about that until the Rio Conference in 1992. And that tells us how far back we were then. A few people were aware of the problems that man was creating for the environment, but in the main, we didn't talk much about it. It was really the Brunton Conference in 87, that our common future, which began to get people to pay attention. By 2012, we're at Rio plus 20. I've been around in academia teaching for 40 years by that point. And the truth is we've made very, very little progress. Because sustainability, to a large extent, is a fig leaf. If you go back 40 years, 1972 was the year in which the Limits to Growth was published by the Club of Rome. Since then, we've had four world summits. And the truth is that the forecasts made in the limits to growth have largely come to pass. Business as usual has continued to create problems about sustainability. So if we're going to make any progress, we have to do business differently. 
Much of my work now actually focuses on over tourism because that's exploded as an issue, particularly in Europe, but not only in Europe. It's a big problem in parts of China, it's a problem in some parts of India, it's certainly a problem in Seoul and South Korea. The problem is that over tourism is the consequence of doing no more than paying lip service to the <coughs> idea of sustainability for 40 years. And it's really time now to accelerate the taking of responsibility for making tourism more sustainable. Not to talk much about climate change, but I do want to remind us that that problem is one which is accelerating faster than we're dealing with it. That problem is just getting worse. The problem with sustainable tourism for me is that it's a vague aspiration. And it's vague in the sense that it uses some very vague ideas. Optimal use, respecting authenticity, providing benefits to all stakeholders. These are very vague concepts. It's hard to make these concrete. But at the district level, or at the individual business level, these things can be made concrete. You can set objectives, you can set limits to change, and you can measure whether you're achieving them. But at the policy level, it's very difficult to come up with a, a satisfactory technical definition. It's only at the very local level that you can do that. And the reality is, as the UNWTO recognises in its policies, it's political leadership which is required to achieve it. And that's one of the reasons I'm particularly pleased to be here today. We're coming towards the end now of the International Year of Sustainable Tourism for Development. There is, so far as I can see, very little to show for another international year of focus on this. Depressingly little. We had some success in the global awards. We found some businesses which are able to describe the impacts they're having in terms of the sustainable development goals, but it's been very, very limited. So to come to tourism, for me, tourism is primarily an economic opportunity for communities and for benefiting conservation. It can bring jobs and economic development. It can create resources for environmental conservation, but the reality is that in most places the national governments very kindly subsidise the visits by tourists to their protected areas because the tourists do not cover the costs of even admitting them into the parks and managing them. That has to change because without doing that you don't have ecotourism and you certainly don't have sustainability. The value of tourism has to be captured and the impacts have to be controlled, which means that tourism has to be managed. And the only people who can manage tourism are the people responsible for the governance of those areas, whether that's a city government or the forestry department or a national park authority. It is their responsibility, it seems to me, and it can be no one else's. They have to take responsibility for managing tourism. Tourism is also a very polluting industry. We like to think of it as not being that, but it's clear, international air travel is 5% of global emissions. That's bigger than most countries individually in terms of its responsibility. Litter, trampling, all impose costs. In the public realm, in London, for example, we have large numbers of tourists sitting around in our, our beautiful, what used to be green parks in central London, now eroded by the pressure of tourist picnicking in St. David's Park, for example, turning it to bare earth. We all have examples of this in all, in all communities. The social and economic impacts are that it drives out other forms of economic activity because it's in theory more profitable, but the question is who is taking the profit. And then, very depressingly, in a lot of places, you get villages hollowed out by people coming in with sex homes. For me, one of the challenges is to use tourism to make it good for able young people to stay living in rural areas and to maintain the economic vibrancy of villages where people might otherwise leave to go and get a good job in the city. Why should all good jobs be in urban areas? Why can't we create good jobs in rural areas? And tourism can do that. It can also enable young people who want to have contact with foreigners and with people from outside the village to have those experiences in the village and not to have to move to the city to have that awareness of people from other places. 
We did some work in Zimbabwe as part of that initial research. And one of the things that we discovered there was that people who had no tourists coming to their village, when we asked them would they like tourists, the number one reason that they would like them was that so somebody would know they were there. That sense of being worth visiting is important to people in rural communities. And that, of course, gives the tourist a fantastic experience when they arrive. But if you don't manage that carefully, it tips over into resentment about the tourist being there. I'm short of time, just take it as read. We create a lot of carbon emissions through tourism. But we also have some very negative social impacts. One that I first became aware of in 2011, and I'm ashamed of the fact that it took until 2011 for me to be aware of this, and it comes back to what was said about me in the introduction. I was sat in a room listening, and somebody I invited to speak at World Travel Market stood up with screeds of paper, and I thought, here we go. This guy is not going to talk for eight minutes, which was the brief. And he did. He talked for something like 15 minutes, and he read out a very carefully prepared script, which talked about what was happening in Cambodia with the growth of orphanages, which were being created by tourism demand. And children were then and still are being trafficked into orphanages because running orphanages was so profitable because of the tourists donating money. We've done a lot of work since 2011 on this issue, but we haven't stopped it. It is a massive challenge for all of us to make the point that, that children are not a tourist attraction. So it's not just not just environmental pollution we need to worry about, we need to worry about what it does in a range of social impacts. Now, I've never been to this state before, so it's particularly difficult to talk like this and very easy to make a complete fool of yourself by talking about a state that you've never visited. But I was almost knocked over by this. I mean, to find the first statement in your mission statement for tourism to be sustainability was frankly extraordinary. I haven't seen that anywhere else. I'm not saying it doesn't exist anywhere else, but I've never seen it before. Nor have I ever seen this putting together of economic and inclusive growth, social equity and integration at the top of anybody's policy. So I got very excited. I thought this is going to be a tremendous experience to go visit this state. And then the second, the third one, sorry, conservation of heritage, and the fourth one, beneficial outcome to all the stakeholders. This is exciting stuff. The policy is great. And I have no idea about implementation. But if we could find a way of actually implementing this policy, we'd make some really big strides forward. It's also true, I think, to say that the centre of gravity for responsible tourism globally is shifting towards India. It is true that in the global awards this year, we have more winners from Africa. We have five of the 12 were from Africa. But that is because Indians are not, Indian people from the Indian subcontinent are not applying for awards. There's some great stuff in India, but you're not applying. And you can only <coughs> give awards to the people who apply. And I want to come back to that in a minute. So what is responsible tourism? Then? Well, the idea behind responsible tourism is simply to say that sustainability is too abstract, too general, we can't define it. What we can say is that people engage with the issues that matter in their community and their place. So in one place it might be how you look at tigers, in another place it might be how you benefit local <coughs> communities economically, in another place it might be about turtles or dolphins. The issues are different from place to place. Water is a big issue in some areas, it's not a big issue in other areas. So where my sister lives in North Wales, there's too much water, they get too much flooding. Um, where I live in East Kent, in England, we're really worried about being on standpipes, we've got water shortages. The issues vary from place to place. There is no specific set of issues which apply everywhere. But what we do know is if you want to get people to engage, you get them to engage with the issues that matter where they are. So you have to pick relevant local issues. Culture and the environmental context are critical. But if you're going to address those things, take responsibility and make a particular place more sustainable and life more sustainable for local communities, 
You've got to engage in the political process. What we've just done through market forces, it's got to involve <coughs> government and government at all levels, national, state, city, right down to the panchayat. It's got to involve all of those different levels of government if it's to be successful. So most, the easiest way to understand what's meant by tourism, is to, responsible tourism, is to say that it's about using tourism to make better places for people to live in. And also, if we talk about the forest, better places for animals and um, the plants to live in. It's about making places better. So it's about using tourism rather than being used by it. And many places are used by tourism rather than that they use tourism on their terms. So one of the things I was saying in conversation before I came in here is that I think one of the challenges for this state is to say what do we want to achieve in each part of the state and how do we do that? What are our priorities for that area? Which is really why I'm delighted that this is being shared with the districts because it seems to me many of these decisions will actually be made at the local level within the state policy framework and then the state brings those different strategies together. You don't hear this very much in, in Africa but you hear it often in Asia that tourism is like a fire. You can use it to cook food on it or it can burn your house down. And you have to make that choice about how you manage tourism. And I think this is an exciting state to take a lead on that. So sustainable tourism and responsible tourism are not the same thing. It makes me really quite cross when I see people using these two words interchangeably. Responsibility is what you do about it. Sustainability is the long-term abstract idea. It's about taking responsibility to make specific changes. It's the difference between the abstract aim and what you do to achieve it. So I was described as stocky. That's very generous. My enemies call me fat. But there we go. The reality is that for my long-term sustainability, I need to lose some weight. I'm not very good at it. Because that's actually much tougher. I can buy into the idea that I ought to lose some weight. But doing it is much tougher. And it's that taking of responsibility. And that applies to tourism as well. It's very easy to say tourism must be sustainable. But deciding you're not going to do certain things in order to ensure that tourism is sustainable is very difficult. And that's where the state action, the government's action, becomes important. Because you're the regulator. Government does the regulation. Government creates the framework within which people compete for advantage. You regulation, good regu regulation is for me critical to achieving responsible tourism. So it's about, it's very simple, identify the issues which matter and which can be addressed through tourism. So one of the issues I think matters enormously in the world is population growth. But we can't tackle that through tourism. It's, it's just not something that tourism can be used to address. But a lot of other issues we can. It's a triple bottom line to tourism management. It's about saying we have to look at environmental, economic and social impacts, not just at the economic impacts. It's about recognising that the way we choose to travel is critical to whether it will be responsible or not. And let me say very clearly, coming to the state for eight hours <coughs> is hardly an example of responsible tourism. It yeah, makes no sense um, to have done that other than the great opportunity talk to a group of people like this and that's a privilege. It will be diverse. The issues that matter vary between states, between ecological regions, between cultures. But what is also critical for responsibility is being transparent. Transparent about what you want to achieve and what you have achieved in going down that road towards sustainability. Ultimately, though, it means accepting that you can't leave it to others. That, that you actually have to take your responsibility and take the action necessary to achieve responsible tourism. Why the word responsibility? Well, the main reason, I think, is every adult I've ever met has a very sophisticated knowledge of what responsibility is. They may not want to take it, but they know what it is. And they know what it is because of the conflicts they had with their parents when they were 13, 14, 15 years old, which was what constituted responsible behaviour. Yeah? Every person has been through that set of very high level, complicated negotiations 
with their parent about what constitutes responsibility. So we have a very sophisticated idea of what that concept means. But clearly, it requires action and it requires change. It was the CEO of um, Shearing's Coaches in the UK, a big UK um, domestic tour operator. He said to my students on one occasion, and I wish I'd thought to say it, that responsibility is free. You can take as much of it as you can handle. But nobody can take responsibility for everything. It's not possible. So focusing on the things which matter in the places where you operate in tourism is critical. Focus is all to achieve. Now this is the Cape Town Declaration from 2002. I'm going to be very quick with this. The slides are being left behind, so you, you can easily see them. The first one is obvious. It's about minimising the negative impacts. The second one, and it's no accident that it, that it comes second, so it is fundamental to making sure that tourism benefits local places. It's about creating economic benefits for local people. It's about decent work. It's about creating opportunities for small entrepreneurs. And Carol has been very good at that. It's about, though, enhancing the well-being of host communities. So it's not just about economic benefits. Maybe about creating better education. It's about a whole range of different things which benefit and make life better for local communities. It's also, and I think this is critical, and, and one of the great strengths of India is the Panchayat system, is being able to talk with local people about what matters to them. And that's where the Kerala work on local economic development came from. In Kerala, responsible tourism came because of the conflict, particularly in places like Kumarapuram, where the local community felt that they were being exploited by tourism which was coming in and giving them no benefit. Work we've done recently, um, there's been a census of that village funded by the Kerala government, shows that nearly every household now recognises tourism benefits them. It's a massive change. And that's because of the focus in Kerala put on local economic benefit. Now what struck me when I was sent um, very kindly by Shwati, she sent me some examples of, of um, businesses in Arissa which are doing amazing things. And I haven't got time to talk about these in detail, but what struck me in looking at them is that these are examples of, of businesses in the state which are taking seriously the challenges that I would regard as the major challenges of responsible tourism, environmental, economic development, and also, I think really importantly, talking with communities about how tourism can benefit their particular community. And you have lots of examples of these, this one, okay, is from Carol. This is CGH Earth Hotels, Coconut Lagoon, where they are rainwater harvesting, deliberately to avoid using the water supply, which might otherwise be, be going to the villages. The problem is, <coughs> the problem is, tourism will always be able to afford to pay more than a local villager for water. So it's best, if you can, to avoid competing with the local community for access to water. This is a, um, something which I think is really quite remarkable. This is using the, um, the law as in a resort to conserve a particular species of cat, which is otherwise threatened. It's a rare breed. It's a really interesting example of doing something which matters to a particular local community. And of course, from this <coughs> comes that engagement with the tourist, which is critical to making responsible tourism work. They get letters from people who've stayed there asking how the cows are doing and how the, the particular calf was about to be born, whether that was successful or not. It's a real point of engagement with the tourists. This is village ways. I don't think they operate in a recipe, but they do operate in a number of, of Indian um, states. What's interesting about them is this focus on enabling people to stay in the villages, encouraging them to stay. Talking about pride in village life, heritage and cultural enhancement, strengthening social unity. I can talk more about that business if you want to. But it's an interesting example of a business founded on entirely responsible tourism lines. And actually, from the conversations we were having before I came in here, I think the model they have of people walking from village to village, walking, not trekking, small distances each day, but actually talking with local people 
as they go and spending money in the local economy is worth thinking about in relation to some of the rural areas here. Help? Okay. The second set are of the, of the same characteristics. Positive contribution to conservation. Very rarely does tourism actually cover the costs of people visiting the national park or the cultural site. Very rarely do they pay enough. Tourists get it too cheap. And it's very nice of you as governments to subsidise the visits by tourists, but I'm not sure it's very sensible in terms of a tourism strategy. It's also important, though, to remember that people have got to have enjoyable experiences and there have got to be meaningful connections for people in these experiences. Because if you don't do that, if it's not culturally sensitive and based on respect, it won't work. And we've got some examples, again, from here, of examples of businesses. I really don't have time to go through these. But businesses which are already in ERISA, it seems to me from their websites, at least, providing good practice in this. And in a way, I think part of the challenge in ERISA is to spread this good practice and encourage more people in the state to follow these models. You've got models within the state which would be worth developing and sharing. So it's about, essentially, taking responsibility for the principle of sustainability. But the problem is that if it's everybody's responsibility, it can very quickly become nobody's. And that's where government action becomes critical. Because there's no point one operator deciding they're going to operate in a way which is totally responsible when they're going to visit the turtles or see the dolphins when everybody else is breaking the rules. There's no point in that, and it won't work, because the destruction of the resource will happen anyway. So the, what I would say is that the role of government in regulation is critical, and that's the big change which I think is beginning to come internationally. It's a struggle, because we've been in a period of, of neoliberalism, but that change is coming as people see that a competitive destination has to be sustainable. If you want to build a reputation for being a tiger reserve, it's no good if the tourism destroys the population of tigers. There's no sustainability, there's no future, there's no competitive advantage. The competitive advantage has to include the principle of sustainability. Otherwise, there'll be nothing for the next generation. So the realisation of benefits turns on economic advantage for local communities and capturing that locally, whether it's through employment or small-scale business opportunity. The antonym, of course, of, of responsible tourism is irresponsibility, and nobody wants to be accused of that. It's one of the reasons, I think, that the concept of responsibility has taken off, because nobody wants to be accused of being irresponsible. I run a Facebook group called Irresponsible Tourism, if you want to see the kind of things which people are called out for. Now, if we look at the travellers, and this is critical as well, I think. This is the UNWTO's major campaign of this year, the International Year. Travel, enjoy, respect. Now you can pick that straight out of responsible tourism. That's what that is. Enjoy the destination, but do it with respect. Recognise that you are a guest in that destination and that you need to behave as a guest. Yeah? When we invite people to come for dinner in our houses, we expect people to behave in a certain way. Why should it be any different when we're invited to visit Arisa? Yeah? That notion of arriving, with a sense of respect and wanting to experience the other is, I think, quite critical to the success of a destination. Now, where we're moving in terms of the international market, there's very little doubt about this. People say, well, China will be different. The evidence is that China isn't different. They're making that progression from group tourism to individual travel more rapidly, certainly than the Europeans did when we discovered tourism in the 1950s. Very quick. Just last year I was in mid Wales fishing, which is what I do for relaxation, and we came out of mid Wales and there was a car, a self drive hire car, parked very inappropriately in the middle of this country lane with four people who jumped out of the car with their cameras to take a photograph of a sheep. Now it's extremely difficult for any person in Wales to understand why anyone would want to take a, a picture of a sheep, because there are more sheep than there are people in Wales. But for them, that was a really exotic experience. 
But the point was, this is four Chinese people in a self-hired drive car, miles from any tourist attraction, in the middle of Midway. No tourists there at all. But there are the Chinese. And the reason this is happening is we're moving from people wanting value for money in their holiday to wanting experience for money. The experience is becoming much more central to travel motivation. <coughs> and people are prepared to pay for that experience because they want the quality and depth of experience which will create memories. And those memories are a joint product between the host and the guest. But it's those memories which fuel the viral marketing, which with social media is becoming more and more important as the way in which people decide where to go on holiday. So generating these memories is something which needs to be done. And that hopefully those memories need to be of good experiences, not of bad ones. Justin Francis, with whom I originally set up Responsible Travel.com, I sold my shares in it some time ago. The point he makes is you should be able to taste the difference in a responsible tourism holiday. And you certainly can if you travel with Village Ways or you go to a CGH property. It is a different experience. And that's really the objective that people need to be looking for in offering these experiences. Now, the other thing to say is tourism is not a natural phenomenon. There's nothing natural about tourism. Tourism is what we make it. It's what we make it as producers and what we make it as consumers. It's entirely constructed by the way in which we behave, whether we're offering the tourism experience or enjoying it. And if it is entirely a social experience, it's not beyond our wit to make it better. Particularly in a state like this, where there are still large areas which don't have a problem with tourism, and where from the bottom up you could build responsible tourism over the next five to ten years, starting with a clean slate. It's much more difficult to retrofit responsible tourism into a destination which has gone wrong. This is, Arisa in that sense, is a very good place to do something better. Access equals egress is a really important point. You can, as much as you want to increase the speed of access to various, to the state and to other places within the state, you need to remember that if people can get there faster, they can leave faster too. Yeah? It's not always a good thing. So for example, the trip the, in Nepal, the trip into Everest Base Camp used to mean a 20 day walk now you can do it in 10. You can't do it faster than that because you, your health won't permit you to do it faster because of the altitude change. But that means they've lost 10 days worth of economic value for every visitor who goes to every space camp. That's actually not very smart, is it? The tour operators want that, but whether the government should want that is a different question. The government needs to think how quickly does it want people to be able to access that destination. Because if you make the destination more accessible, you lose bed nights, and you have increased numbers of people, which may create its own problems as well. It's something you need to think about each time somebody says they want more. You also need to think really carefully about how you measure, measure success. Just talking about international arrivals, for me, is crazy. I mean, I count as a visitor to your state as an international visitor today. But I've been here for eight hours. That's how I leave. I mean, that's... I hope there's an intellectual value, but there's certainly no economic value in having me here for eight hours. The length of stay would be a much more sensible way of measuring it. But I think the most critical thing is spend and the retained yield. How much of what is spent in this state stays in the state, in the local community? And every rupee that stays in a village is staying in the state. So I see no contradiction in this. It seems to me that's, well, that's how you ought to be measuring Success. What is the contribution to the local economy? How much of the budget of the, of the forestry department is coming from tourism? Those are the kinds of measures I would be using if I was in your shoes. <coughs> I think that was my fault. It was. So, quickly, to move on to destinations. The challenge then at the, at the destination level, whether that's the state, a city, a village, a, a forest area, the challenge is to use tourism to achieve sustainable development. The aspiration, and this is really the, the question which now when I work I ask of every policymaker I meet. Are you using tourism or is tourism using you? 
In most places in Europe, they will be, if they're honest, they'll say tourism is using us, we're not using tourism. Seems to me in this state you have a great opportunity to build a whole strategy based on using tourism for the benefit of your environment and your communities. You could really do that. It's about what we do, and it's about making sure that we tackle the, the issues which matter at the local level. Now, Sir Colin Marshall, when he launched the Tourism Tomorrow Awards, at the time he was chairman of British Airways, really let the cat out of the bag. And I think this is the quote you need to hang on to. He said that tourism in the travel industry is essentially the renting out for short-term lets of other people's environments. Now, the question, the big political question is, who collects the rent? Now, clearly, the tour operators want to collect the rent. The airlines, you bring tourists here, are collecting rent. How much rent is the government taking, and how much rent is going to local communities? They're the people who have to put up with the tourists. Who's paying to clean up after the tourists? Is it revenues earned from tourism which pays for that? Or is it the taxpayers of the state who are paying for that? I think it ought to be from the money that the tourists have contributed in some way to the local economy. So su successful tourist destinations offer something unique. They create a sense of place, a reason to visit, a sense of identity. And we should recognise that two, no two communities are ever exactly the same. You can always find something which is a point of difference. I put Visit Ludlow in there because that's the one place that I meticulously go to every year in the UK. I doubt it whether anybody, has anybody in the room heard of Ludlow? Well done. It's very rare that anybody outside Britain has heard of it, and many people in Britain have never heard of it. It's an isolated rural town on the borders with Wales, so it's really remote. But it offers you a fantastic experience as a, as a visitor. And I think there are probably lots of areas in this state which would offer a great experience in the same way. And you don't have to attract international visitors. There are a lot of people in Delhi who'd be very pleased to get out, including some of the people I travelled with today, be very pleased to get out every year and have an experience in an attractive village uh, somewhere in this state. It doesn't have to be international visitors. So you have to decide who you want to attract, who do you want to invite, who do you want to share the different parts of a risk with. This is very contentious at the moment in Barcelona, as you probably know. This is actually a genuine big poster put up on the beach at Barcelona Letter saying this is our recreational area, it's our place where we have a right to rest. We are not a tourist attraction. Now that's what happens when tourism goes badly wrong. I'm not, I, you probably are familiar with that, but I, I, there isn't time to talk about it. The notion that the, the problem is to regulate the use of something which is a common property is very difficult. But you can do that in a, in a whole range of ways, which is a different lecture. Even the cruise industry, at last, this is revolutionary change for the cruise industry. This is the CEO of Carnival actually saying, We've got to listen to the locals about over tourism. That was a real shock to see that appear in print a couple of months ago. We'll take that opportunity up and ask him to come and speak at World Travel Office next year about what he thinks that means in practice. But at least he's got beyond the denial. Because for a very long time, the cruise industry simply denied that they create a problem. This is the chief executive of one of the world's largest, one of the two largest um, cruise lines, recognising that they do create a problem and they've got to listen to local communities. That is progress on the stage towards responsibility. The advert on the left there is genuine. It's from a really good UK tour operator. We're just honest. When the place gets small, we move on. The piece on the right is graffiti, very good quality graffiti from Barcelona. Barcelona. Good for the tourists, bad for the neighbours. And then the neighbors of Metro. I think partnerships and, and collaboration are critical to this, but the government has to remain the dominant partner in the partnership. No not just having public-private partnerships, which are actually just a license for business to do as it wishes. And that has been the model in much of the neoliberal um, changes which have come about. And that's what's led to the problems of Kana with the encirclement of the park by um, properties, because everybody wants to have a property there. Cusco is the worst example I've seen of this in Peru. 
where the tourism minister normally comes from, Cusco, which is next to Machu Picchu, where there are far too many hotels, but everybody wants to have a, a hotel in, in, in Cusco because they think they're going to make a fortune. In the north of Peru, they have some of the best archaeology in the world, much, much older than um, the Machu Picchu, which is just medieval, it's not very interesting at all, really. Um, but they've developed no tourism there at all because the tourism industry tends to concentrate around the honeypots. And again, that is something which you can control through your fiscal planning processes. And I was amazed to be met at the airport by tourism and planners together. I normally can't meet planners that don't want even to talk about tourism. And yet the decisions made in the structure plans and the land use plans are fundamental to managing tourism. And what I would argue is that in, in Arisa you've got a real opportunity to bring the different parts of government together to help to control tourism in the way it contributes to the local economy. They call it, in South Africa, they call it a whole of government approach. In, um, in Britain, people talk about joined up government. We don't do it very well in Britain, frankly. They, they are slightly better at it in South Africa. But the point is, it's, the destination is managed in the end by elected politicians and appointed administrative civil servants at all levels. What's happened in Barcelona now is that they have separated promotion from management. <coughs> in too many places, management and promotion are run by the same organisation. That's always a mistake. Incredibly, in Ireland, please don't spread this too far, but incredibly in Ireland, they have just appointed a marketeer to be in charge of their tourism management organisation. So now they have a marketeer running tourism marketing and tourism management. I think that raises some very interesting questions. Um, but the truth is, every single department of government has some capacity to assist in managing tourism. And cross-government committees seem to need to be fundamental. And that's clearly part of the thinking in this state about how tourism should be managed. And again, I think reasons why I would want to be optimist, optimistic about the opportunities here. So, the critical thing is to get agreement about what the issues are, agree how to address the issues, prioritise, decide what can be done locally, and then measure and report progress. Now, I'm, not, I'm really running out of time, but I just wanted to say to you that there is no business case for responsible tourism. There are business cases. Different directors sat around the board will have different reasons. Many people will do it simply because it's the right thing to do. Chief execs will do it because it's about minimising risks and about making sure you've got a licence to operate. Because if the local community decides they don't want you there, you're either going to have to spend a lot of money on security or move out. People in marketing will be interested in product quality. The finance guy will be interested in cost savings. Human resources will be interested in staff morale. And then there are all the market advantages that come from responsible tourism. There are multiple reasons why a business might adopt responsible tourism. And in my experience of talking with boards, no one argument ever wins the case. It's always a matter of putting up multiple reasons why they would do it. There is a broad consumer trend, must be true, it's Harvard Business School for writing about it, must be true, um, about the growth of the experience economy. Pine talk about authenticity and new strain of consumer demand, sorry, consumer desire. What we mean by authenticity is another whole lecture, but nonetheless, the fact that that is expected now is very fundamental. So the market opportunity, if I was pitching to businesses, so I use the argument, there's a trend towards experiential tourism, that's what people want. People want to be ethical. They won't recommend things they think might be slightly unethical. So if you want word of mouth publicity, which we know to be the most powerful, you've got to have something which is ethical and responsible. People want a guilt-free holiday. Nobody wants to go back thinking, I wish I hadn't done that. Look what's happened now with elephant, right, elephant back riding, which has become something people don't want to do anymore. Visiting orphanages, people are now beginning to reflect on that and think, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. That's not good for the destination where it happened. Um, it's not price competition. It doesn't necessarily cost more to be responsible. 
offers richer and more meaningful experiences in the extent of the state. What's not to like about the idea of responsible tourism? Green Hotel are talking about the, the fact that they, the hotels need a 90% reduction in carbon. That is a terrifying figure. But that's the hotel industry's own trade newspaper saying that that's what needs to be achieved. I'm going to skip over that. Um, greenwashing is a real challenge around this. Every time a traveller or a holidaymaker goes into a certified hotel and finds, and this happened to me in Morocco a couple of years ago, go into the room, it, the temperature set at 15 degrees, the TV on is, well, is in the room, welcoming me to the room, the lights are all left on, and um, there's no, uh, there isn't a low flow shower. And yet this is a, a gold standard, certified, sustainable hotel. Every time a tourist experiences that, it undermines the value of certificate, of certification. Evidence really matters. And for the WTM's Responsible Tourism Awards, I write every year a set of reasons why the judges have chosen those uh, particular businesses. I'll be doing the same with the Indian Responsible Tourism Awards, which are run by Outlook India. It's really critical that we talk about why something is responsible. Because unless we do that, we won't educate the consumers and we won't be able to distinguish the real practitioners of responsible tourism from those who are just using the words. We need to make people embarrassed to use the words unless they can demonstrate that what they're doing is responsible. And I would ask the um to be sure to do that. It's very easy for it just to disappear into greenwashing. So what I want to say in conclusion, I'm running out of time, is that the principle is simply to use tourism to achieve sustainable development, to bring sustainable development through tourism, to use tourism rather than to be used by it, and to talk to suppliers, talk to the politicians, talk with schools and parents and farmers, and look at how tourism can contribute an additional livelihood to people who have already got sustainable rural livelihoods. If you've got a, a, a household um, which is surviving as a subsistence farming household, even a small amount of additional money coming from tourism dramatically changes the lives of that household. Agriculturalists who've worked in the Gambia, where I've worked a lot in Africa, say that you can always tell that if you're an agricultural development which households have got somebody working in tourism because they have more capital equipment. They'll have a better plan, they'll have better tools because the revenue that comes from tourism provides that household with some additional resource in terms of cash and which enables them to move beyond just subsistence agriculture. And tourism, you spread the benefits, can benefit large numbers of people in rural communities particularly. So it's about making better tourism. It's about accentuating the positive and minimising the negative. It's about building the meaning, having positive impacts, reducing risk, and improving the bottom line for businesses, and creating sustainable businesses which will be there for future generations to benefit from as well. I can only suggest that we take responsibility, and it seems to me that in this state there is a real opportunity to do that. Thank you for listening.